it's not like it used to be. <laughs> Waikato swamps. Today they're a training ground for the army, but just over a hundred years ago, this would have been the real thing. Much of the North Island of New Zealand was a battleground. The struggle was to cost some Maori tribes their precious land. There are still men with guns in the Waikato swamps. Nowadays, though, the shooting strictly for pleasure. Unlike the soldiers, the duck shooters are here because they want to be. They even pay for the privilege of getting wet and cold. Today, of course, the swamps have mostly been drained and only duck shooters and conservationists show very much interest in what's left. But a little over a century ago, large areas in the Waikato Valley and on the Hauraki Plains were still under swamp, just like this. That didn't discourage the colonial government, though, nor land speculators in Auckland. No matter how wet and unpromising that land seemed, they already had their eyes on it. But the local Maori tribes had other ideas. They decided that the Pākehā had already taken enough of their land, and if he wanted any more of it, he was going to have to fight every inch of the way. And fight they did for nearly 10 years through the late 1850s and the 1860s. Queen Victoria sent in her best troops, veterans of the Crimean War. They fought alongside a mixed bag of local troops, forest rangers, militia, and loyalist Maoris. Facing them were the warriors of the Maori King movement, tribes that had banded together to resist the Europeans. The key to victory was the Waikato River. As the Europeans advanced deeper and deeper into Maori territory, they built forts along its banks. Places such as Merrimeri and Mercer became armed strongholds. From these secure bases, the soldiers could take on the Maori warriors more or less when it suited them. The Maori was outmaneuvered, outnumbered, and outgunned. Even so, it was the Maori who chose the time and place of the final battle in the Waikato. Leading them was a chief called Rewi Maniapoto. <laughs> 
Ake, Ake, Ake. Seventy years later, this great battle was relived in the early New Zealand feature film, Rewi's Last Stand. The place the Waikato chiefs chose for the showdown was Orakau. Inside a crude par, 300 men, women and children waited for the soldiers. As a defensive position, it was almost useless. The hill was too low to get much protection, and the par didn't even have a supply of fresh water. More than a thousand troops closed in, but for three days the defenders held them off. Time after time they refused to surrender. When at last their ammunition was nearly gone, the Maori made a run for it. Only a handful got through. The rest were cut down by soldiers waiting in the swamps. Queen Victoria's soldiers had triumphed. The Maori had lost the battle and the war. But Rewi Maniapoto escaped, and the Maori King movement was still alive, perhaps to fight another day. The invasion by the soldier settlers ground to a halt along a new and dangerous border. Now it was their turn to defend themselves against any attack. They built forts like the one at Alexandra near Mount Pirongia. If the Maori moved back across the border, the whole town could shelter in the fort while the militia held off the attack. It's a simple piece of engineering, really. Far simpler, in fact, than the Maoris themselves used in the construction of their own pars. But the weapon that gave the Pākehā the edge all along was the simplest thing of all. It was, in fact, the bayonet. In close hand-to-hand -hand combat, it could be really deadly. It was rather like giving a boxer an extra meter of reach. The Maoris just had no counter for this. The fort was built, of course, after Rui's last stand at Orakau, and it's not difficult to see why it was built just here. They built the Alexandra Redoubt right here at the junction of the Punia River and the Waipa, which flows north to Narawahia where it meets the Waikato. The idea was to build a string of forts across here, one at Kihikihi, near where Rui fought his last stand at Orakau, and another on the Waikato River at Cambridge. This string of forts marked the line beyond which the Maoris retreated. None of the redoubts was, in fact, ever needed. But Alexandra here, Perongia as we call it now, was for a year or two at least quite a thriving little garrison town and a river port. Indeed, it was intended at that time that it should serve as the capital of the Waikato. It also serviced militiamen who were trying to make something at the time of their 50-acre rural allotments out in the swamp. But not surprisingly, they preferred to live on their town allotments uh, rather than alone out on the frontier, because that's what it was, virtually an international frontier between the Queen's country over there and the Maori King's country over here. The settlers never knew when the Maori would try to take back the land, and few of them knew anything about farming anyway, so one by one they drifted away. Land sharks snapped up their allotments.
Josiah Firth got his land by negotiations with a friendly Maori chief, but he still didn't trust the King Country Maoris. The centerpiece of his enormous estate at Matamata was a concrete blockhouse with gun slits in every wall. Like the redoubt at Pirongia, it was never needed, but it shows what a lasting impression Rewi and his followers had made on the European settlers. This, remember, was as late as 1881. But the southern part of the Auckland province was hemmed in between the hostile king country to the south and the swamps to the north, so that the development of a huge and potentially fertile area came to a standstill for the next 30 years. On other frontiers, though, things were different. By 1881, even passive resistance by the Maori had been crushed in the coastal areas like Taranaki. The land was being carved up and young men from the South Island moved north. Many of them owned little more than a sharp axe. But that was enough to carve a clearing in the virgin forest. It was a good start. One vital ingredient, though, was missing. What the early settlers, the new arrivals, needed most desperately was a source of cash income to enable them to keep body and soul together whilst they cleared the bush, to enable them to get a start on the land. How that problem was solved must surely rank as one of the strangest stories to emerge from our pioneering history. This is it. It's a quite ordinary fungus and not very attractive. But almost incredibly, this fungus was to provide the source of cash income. And just at the right time, thanks to the business acumen of a Chinese trader whose name was Chu Chong. Chu Chong was one of hundreds of Chinese who came to New Zealand in the 1860s to look for gold. But Chu Chong was different. He spoke good English, which meant he could do business with both Chinese and Europeans setting out for the Otago gold fields. So instead of actually digging for gold himself, he set up shop in Dunedin and fitted out others. Eventually, gold on the Otago fields ran out and miners left town. Chong moved on too. He joined the drift north to the forest clearings of Taranaki. There, he saw the fungus on rotting tree stumps. Back home in China, that same fungus was a great delicacy. So Chu Chong started to buy it from the settlers at threepence a pound. For the cowcockies, this trade was a godsend. Their youngsters could collect the fungus while they got on with the business of dairy farming. Chu Chong tried his hand at that too, exporting their butter. By now, the Dunedin had pioneered refrigerated cargoes to London. But Chong sent his butter the traditional way, packed in kegs of brine. Everyone who tasted it found it revolting. So in 1887, Chu Chong built his own factory at Eltham. This meant he could keep an eye on every stage of production. Within two years, his butter was winning prizes just at the time when hatred for the Chinese in New Zealand was getting out of hand. Chu Chong was safe enough, though. He was a pillar of the local community. He'd married a Masterton woman and raised a family in Eltham. He was even something of a patriot. He called his works the Jubilee Factory in honor of the Queen. Before Chu Chong died in 1920, the locals returned the compliment. This illuminated address was signed by most of the cowcockies near Eltham. It was a rare moment of backslapping in a world that still offered the dairy farmer only drudgery and toil.
It was reported from Britain that the first butter that Chu Chong sent there in 1884 tasted like axle grease. And that's really not surprising in view of the conditions under which it was produced and shipped. A shed like this at that time was quite a luxury and very, very rare. Most pioneering cow cocky families milked their three or four cows out in the open amongst the fire blackened stumps. By the mid-1880s, New Zealand was already into the longest depression in its history. For the unemployed and for thousands of would-be farmers, the future seemed very bleak indeed. Nearly all the best land had already been bought and tied up. Yet, 30 years late later, the dairy industry was booming and thousands of new farmers were enjoying the prosperity that it had brought. What it added up to was nothing less than a revolution. It was a revolution that happened not in the country, but in the towns. Things were tough enough for the small farmers, but they were even more miserable for the people in the cities, especially in the South Island. The Doss houses began to fill as unemployment soared. Church workers scrounged farthings to feed the thousands of swaggers looking for work. So many people were leaving New Zealand that cartoonists compared it to the biblical exodus. A series of waterfront strikes added to the general misery. But when the revolution came, it was a peaceful affair. It happened at the general election of 1890, and the cartoonists had another field day. They were poking fun at a group of men who for the first time in New Zealand were fighting an election together. In effect, New Zealand's first political party. They called themselves the Liberals and they promised to help the wage earner and the small farmer. They were swept to power under John Balance and his cabinet contained names that New Zealanders would never forget. Dick Seddon, the man who would very soon succeed him as Prime Minister. Joseph Ward, another future Prime Minister. William Pember Reeves, a little too left-wing for many of his colleagues. But for the man on the land, the most important figure was a huge, bad-tempered Scot called John Mackenzie. He'd been a struggling farmer himself, a landless shepherd in Otago. Mackenzie was obsessed with land reform, a passion he'd brought with him from his native Scotland. It's a long way from the highlands of Scotland to the farmlands of New Zealand. But that giant Gaelic-speaking New Zealand Minister of Lands was born just over those hills there. And what John Mackenzie saw as a child here in Rossshire left a lifelong impression on his mind. A century and a half ago, throughout the Highlands, tenant farmer families were being thrown off their small holdings and out of their stone cottages, never to return. They were evicted by landlords anxious to replace the crofters' small-scale farming with extensive sheep rearing. John Mackenzie was then a child of six or seven. 
But all his life he remembered the Glencalvey families sheltering between these gravestones in this churchyard and sleeping under canvas beneath these very trees. Fifty years later, Hansard reported that in a speech in the New Zealand House of Representatives, Mackenzie said that the only place in the world for the crofters to go without being thrown into jail was amongst the dead in this cemetery. The crofters who sought refuge here felt so wretched they scratched messages for posterity on the church window panes. Some blamed themselves for their misery, but Mackenzie was to lay the blame elsewhere. What all this meant to New Zealand was that in 1860, when John Mackenzie married a crofter's daughter and sailed the same day for Otago, he carried with him a hatred of landlords. He also took to New Zealand an unshakable conviction that in his new country, the small man should have access to land of his own. But when Mackenzie reached Otago, he couldn't even get a job, let alone a bit of land. When at last he did find work, it was at Pukitapu near Palmerston South, and it's here that Otago remembers him. Mackenzie is said to have looked out over Otago from here and vowed that in New Zealand things were going to be different. He made a start in provincial politics, and worked his way towards his real goal, a seat in the colonial parliament. Mackenzie became Minister of Lands in 1891, and for a decade his furious temper and his frequent lapses into Gaelic were to enliven proceedings in parliament here. But he immediately got to work and framed legislation to enable the small man to get his feet onto a bit of land of his own. The power of Parliament was to be turned against the big estates, the millions of hectares owned by just a handful of men. One of the biggest was Cheviot Hills in Canterbury, and this was to become Mackenzie's first target. Cheviot belonged to a land baron from Australia, William Robinson. Big land meant big money, hence his nickname, Ready Money Robinson. At Cheviot, this one man owned 40,000 hectares. His manager lived in what was modestly called the cottage. It came with a few little extras, though, including in the cellar its own private jail. Robinson lived in the mansion, as he called it, one of the finest homes in Canterbury. From there, he ruled like some lord of the manor. Ready Money Robinson represented everything that John Mackenzie hated most, wealth, power and greed for land. But the two were never to cross swords because Robinson died in 1889, shortly before the Liberals came to power and the estate passed into the hands of his daughters. With Robinson out of the way, the estate was a sitting duck. The first shots were fired by the tax department. The new owners claimed that Cheviot Hills was worth 260,000 pounds, but the tax officials disagreed. They said the estate was worth 40,000 pounds more. The owners replied that if the government really thought the estate was worth 300,000 pounds, it should be prepared to buy the run at that price. It was a trap, and the owners walked right into it. Mackenzie pounced. He had Cheviot Hills bought at once and sent in a team of surveyors to carve up the estate. Then came the day Canterbury had been waiting for, the day the rest of Robinson's property went up for sale. 
His flock of 80,000 sheep was one of the largest in the colony, and now it was broken up. The estate was divided into nearly 60 farms, and a new township was pegged out. For a few years, they even called it Mackenzie. In Robinson's day, only 80 people had lived on the estate. Before long, there was a community of 650, and it was growing fast. If the mighty Cheviot could fall, no great estate was safe. By the turn of the century, two million hectares of farmland had been offered to the Crown. Nearly 2,000 families had been settled with government help. The modest revolution had been a success. Robinson's mansion remained standing until 1932 when it burned to the ground. Today his front lawn's a playing field. Where the great house used to stand, there's a concrete changing shed. Modern Cheviot is John Mackenzie's legacy in the South Island. But it wasn't in the South Island that his policies were to have the greatest impact. Egmont in Taranaki has been quiet for centuries. At the foot of the volcano, though, it's a different story. Man has been very active there, especially since the time of John Mackenzie. The legislation drawn up by Mackenzie and his colleagues gave the small farmer access to the land and money to develop it. Maori land was purchased and Taranaki was opened up for dairy farming. The boundaries drawn by Mackenzie's surveyors have left marks that fan out as neatly as the spokes of a wheel. But dairying in Taranaki was a far cry from sheep farming at Cheviot. For a start, the dairy farmer had to milk his cows twice a day, seven days a week. But at the turn of the century, there was another problem, transport. By horse and cart was the only way the farmer could take his milk to the creamery. By the time he'd hauled the whole milk there, waited his turn in the queue and made the trip home, he'd only just enough time left to milk his cows. So every dairy farm had to be within five or six kilometers of a creamery. It was a tough, monotonous life, and conditions were primitive, but help was on the way. This is a gadget that, after the turn of the century, completely changed the daily life and routine of the New Zealand dairy farmer. This is the home separator. It worked like this. Pretty slow to take on, slow to take off, and indeed the first farmers to use it in the Warrapa complained that it needed rather too much elbow grease. This gadget saved the farmer waiting for 12 hours or so until the 
cream came to the top of the milk. Here we could get instant separation of cream from milk. The milk, as you can see, comes out there, and the cream comes through here. This reduced the volume of the original milk from the cow to about one-tenth. And this, of course, saved him a tremendous amount of labor and cartage when it came to shipping this to the dairy factory instead of the whole milk. It's fairly hard work, all right, but that wasn't the reason for it's not taking on for the best part of 20 years. Even the Department of Agriculture resisted the home separation of cream because they were somewhat scared about the hygiene of conditions in the cow sheds of those days. What it needed to make this gadget take on was an outsider's imagination. That outsider was William Goodfellow. Though brought up on a dairy farm, he was essentially a businessman. Goodfellow began his business career in a hardware store in Auckland's Queen Street. In 1904, he moved to Hamilton, which was just starting to develop. He did well in the town at first, but then a business deal went wrong, and Goodfellow was left with a load of dairy equipment on his hands. He decided to take a gamble. He used the equipment to open his own factory in Hamilton. But first, he took a long, hard look at the dairy industry. What he saw was inefficiency on a grand scale. Though the home separator had been available for years, farmers were still carting their whole milk to creameries. Goodfellow decided that his factory would accept only home separated cream and that idea worked. His factory quickly grew into a wealthy co-op and his suppliers prospered. But for Goodfellow, this was only the start. He was also the first to introduce another novelty. This old battle wagon could probably collect and carry to the factory the cream from 20 farms in less time than up to then it had taken one farmer to get his cream to the factory. And as every farmer will tell you, time saved is money gained. And time saved on one job can be time used on another. Goodfellow was soon doing so well that his rivals just had to follow suit. Other co-ops built up lorry fleets. Competition for the farmer's home-separated cream became fierce. Vehicles from rival companies chased each other down remote country roads. It was obvious that sooner or later the co-ops themselves would have to cooperate. By 1920, most of those in the Waikato South Auckland area had merged to form the world's largest dairy company. Goodfellow became its managing director and took on a new challenge to find markets abroad for the giant company's products. Soon he was striding the streets of London, putting New Zealand dairy products firmly on the world map. the industry enjoyed at the turn of the century helped to finance the spectacular growth of the nation's economy. Though South Island cities enjoyed a share of that growth, after 1900 the focus of development shifted irresistibly to the north. 
thanks to people like William Goodfellow, many of the fears about the nation's future that had lingered since the 1880s were now laid to rest. Looking back half a century, the optimism of the 1920s appears naive. Just around the corner were the Great Depression and the Second World War. But at the time, no one had any way of knowing that the party would soon be over. The depression halted just about everything, but not the dairy industry. The momentum built up by Goodfellow carried it through the 30s and the 40s. The old cart tracks in Taranaki and the Waikato became the best network of sealed roads in the North Island. The Kalkokis saw to that. The road gangs worked for the county councils, and most of the councillors were dairy farmers. So before long, Tarsil reached nearly every farm gate. There was also the rural dawn of the age of electricity. Convenience and cleanliness came at last to the dairy farm. Where once a man could handle 20 cows, now he could milk 200. Electricity didn't make his job any less monotonous, but at last he was plugged into the age of mass production. <laughs> production meant mass transport. New Zealand was the first country to use road tankers to carry milk and to carry beer. The small factories were swallowed up and replaced by huge industrial complexes. They were still co-ops but operating on a scale that pioneers like Chu Chong would never have imagined. By the time the Tirapa factory was built near Hamilton in the 1950s, New Zealand was producing butter and cheese far more efficiently than any other country. Britain was buying nearly all of it. It was a perfect arrangement, but it was too good to last. What nobody expected after the war was that, for the first time in history, the countries of Western Europe would get together. New politics replaced old loyalties. As a member of the enlarged European Economic Community, Britain was now obliged to support farmers like Hans and Christina Carstens in Schleswig-Holstein. Germany's equivalent of the Waikato. You'd wonder how a farmer with only 20 cows and this old-fashioned system of outdoor milking could ever make a living. But most German and European livestock farming is hopelessly uneconomic in New Zealand terms. Only the willingness of Europe's city folk to pay outrageous prices for the food they consume enables most EEC farmers to survive and to keep their precious land in production. To keep small dairy farmers like Herr Carstens on the land, 
there's been pressure since the 1960s to exclude New Zealand's low-cost dairy products from the common market countries, including Britain. New Zealand's response has been to seek markets elsewhere. On New Zealand farms, cow cockies have had to become even more efficient. This is semen. It's from one of New Zealand's finest bulls. It takes only one sperm to fertilize a dairy cow, and this bull can produce 10,000 million at a time. But what makes him important to New Zealand dairy farmers is that his daughters are top producers. With all the qualities necessary to lift the productivity of our dairy herds. So valuable is the sperm, the semen from a super bull of this sort, the scientists have developed methods of diluting it in order to make it go much further. In fact, you can thin it down enormously, and it still does the job. So one bull can fertilize many thousands of cows, and every calf inherits his special qualities. The sperm's sealed in plastic straws, like this one. And this is just about as close as most New Zealand dairy cows will ever get to a real live bull. On the outside of the straw here is the bull's name and number and his breed. And his name is Welburn P.G. Butterman. This is Butterman. Already in five years he's sired hundreds of thousands of calves, more than any other bull anywhere in the world. Technicians have taken his semen from Newstead here to most New Zealand dairy farms. But even pressure from the common market can't change the way some things are done. From the moment the calf's pushed reluctantly into the world, though, it's at the mercy of market forces. The farmer's only interested in increasing milk production. If the calf's a male, all it can look forward to is one short ride to the freezing works. The bobbies are slaughtered within three or four days of birth. Almost every part of their carcass can be used. As dairy farming becomes more efficient, life for the cow cocky becomes more relaxed. For some, Wednesday afternoon at the races is now part of the farming routine. Occasionally, there's a Waikato downpour, just a gentle reminder that only a hundred years ago, the race course at Tirapa was surrounded by swamps. Few of the swamps are left, but the descendants of Rewi Maniapoto have certainly survived. By the end of last century, Maori numbers had dwindled to about 40,000. Now they number 300,000. <laughs> 
they've learned the Pakeha's game and decided to play along with it, they've won an increasing share of the action. Few people, Maori or Pakeha, remember that the Puniu River was once a hostile border. Nowadays, the smooth green pastures stretch out evenly on both sides. What's happening there today affects farmers equally on both sides of the old frontier. Good pasture land will grow good crops too. Maize more or less looks after itself and the farmer need hardly get his hands dirty. With any luck at all, at the end of the season, he can look forward to a harvest of gold. So it's not hard to see why in the last 10 years so many cow cockers have turned to this style of farming. But in the search for new ideas, some farmers are going another way. John Mackenzie, the former shepherd, have ever imagined this. These Perrondale ewes are part of a dairy flock. They're milked twice a day, just like cows. The milk's made into feta cheese, another idea that's new to New Zealand. All these innovations affect the landscape. As our ideas change, new land is broken in and old land used better or abandoned. Take the township of Deniston on the west coast of the South Island. 50 years ago, it was a thriving mining settlement. 2,000 people lived here. Deniston was famous for two things, some of the finest coal in the world and its railway, the incline that carried the coal down to the steamers on the coast. Who would ever have imagined that one day New Zealand would think it no longer needed the incline or the coal? This town depended exclusively on that coal, so that when other forms of energy replaced coal, there was just nothing for Deniston to do. It simply died on its feet, and today only a dozen of those 2,000 people are left. The few remaining miners live down on the coast now, away from the wind and the cold. The old ghost town has become one of the landmarks of an age that's been left behind. Here in Deniston, man's left some pretty ugly scars on the landscape. But in Taranaki and the Waikato, his landmarks are green fields, productive farms and attractive towns. Looking at this, you realize, I think, that the century-long drift of the north has perhaps not been entirely in vain. 